good afternoon or good evening or good morning wherever you're viewing from uh, across the world. My name is Sizizo Piri and I'm an exhibitions producer here at New Art Exchange and I'm here to introduce today's event which is a which is laced um, in search of what connects us a panel discussion taking place between three exhibiting artists from our current laced exhibition. And before we get into the conversation, um, we've just got a few housekeeping rules to go through with you. So um, while delivering content online, New Art Exchange strives to create a safe space where guests, staff and audiences can work together confidently and in mutual respect. This event is being recorded and will remain online for future reference here on NAE's YouTube channel. To ask any questions during the Q&A, which will take place during the end of this event, you can use the chat function on YouTube. If there are a lot of questions, we will curate um, the questions um, for our guests. And finally, we'd love to hear any feedback from you. So at the end of this event, if you could please take a few minutes to complete a short survey that we'll post in the chat towards the end of the event, um, this will help to continue, us to continue to improve the work that we do. So um, um, before we go into the panel discussion, um, just a little bit about the exhibition that inspired this panel discussion, which is Laced, um, that was curated by Lauren Hansey-Gordon. Um, Laced is a network of artists linked to curator Lauren Hansey-Gordon through shared connections to Africa and its diasporas. For Laced, Africa is England, Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, France, Germany, Guyana, and the US. As a temporary stitch work to hold together a set of ideas, impressions, and connections, Gordon began the curatorial process by developing a poetic text guide to guide the selection and commissioning of works, and her research has accumulated into a rich web of intersections that offers viewers a glimpse into the multiplicity of female diasporic experience. The featured artists, um, who include Simni Kiwe Balungo, Rahima Gambo, Wara Natasha Ogunji, Zora Apoku, Tabita Razir, Lorato Shadi, and Michaela Yearwood Dan, profoundly in, are in, they are all in profoundly invested in the process. Materials and physicality of making art and interested in the burdens of physical and emotional labour placed on women across societies, particularly women of colour, as well as the role technology and internet play in producing new forms of labour. Love as a source of creative energy, as articulated by um, feminist scholar Bell Hooks in her seminal text, All About Love, is also a key curatorial inspiration that, we can, that can be traced through the show. Whilst foregrounding the work of contemporary African artists, the exhibition issues an invitation to viewers to reflect upon shared human experiences that transcend categories of gender and geography, and which have been fundamentally to upturned, questioned, and negotiated anew this pandemic era. A powerful and wide-ranging exhibition, Laced is a meditation on the threads that connect us to ourselves and each other. And um, as part of this discussion, we'll have three of the exhibiting artists with us today. First artist is Simni Kiwe Balungo, who is an artist from Johannesburg, South Africa, and currently um, based in Amsterdam. Interested in knowledge, production, and how it produced and disseminated, and by whom Balungo uses film, sound, and text to explore socio-historical phenomena and their nuances as a commonplace ecology. In Simna Kiwe's practice, she wrestles between the questions and inexhaustible potential answers of these narratives. Lately, she enjoys listening to gospel music and has been thinking about apparies. So we'll go ahead and um, get um, Simna Kiwe to present first of all, and um, we'll continue with the other artists. Hello, hi. Um, I'm wondering if we could pull out the PDF presentation. Um, my contribution, yes, um, my contribution to this exchange, which is, uh, it's great that uh, it tested to again many kinds of delays and pauses and uncertainties. It was quite beautiful that it came together in the way that it did and how resistant, resilient it was. Um, my, my contribution to the exhibition uh, are series of uh, cassette tapes, uh, nine locations. Cassette tapes come from uh, a residency that I was actually facilitated by 
the curator in Hansi. Um, in 2019, where I was invited to come to the Wising Art Centre in Cambridge, and then also I spent two weeks in London, which was very nice. And I, uh, um, I had a, a cassette tape Walkman, which I use anyways, uh, but then it kind of uh, developed into my studio and later into a walking slash mobile studio where I would record a lot of my thoughts. And because um, at Wising, where we're in this uh, residency, it's pretty much country. Uh, and my body felt a bit different to be in that kind of environment because, um, yeah, because of, of, you know, land, because of, of uh, how my body got there, uh, because of how my body uh, Cambridge is or present in Cambridge, but the UK as a whole. Uh, I felt some incongruous. I was taking these long walks, which is not really groundbreaking or breathtaking, but uh, the more that were then methodology, uh, walking also became an activity that was leisure, but also uh, a form of labor. Uh, and I did the tape series called Nas, um, of which the bulk recorded during this residence in 2019. Um, and then uh, for Laced, I did some um, as a film. I saw these cuts and I figured when I was through all the material, I found like it was much of my work. I was like, oh no. So, so um, I've been kind of working with the. Uh, um, mostly organ based elements, organ piano. I'm not a musician, but as a pathology, anyways, I brought in that kind of musical aspect as a you know, just actually walk and walk. Um, if you had to, if you had been listening to music, not just sound, but actually music, um, becoming into this form of work. So um, the the exhibition that features these tapes from 2019, the supplementary. Uh... Hi everyone. Um, just want to apologise. There we've had uh, some um, connection um, challenges. Um, hopefully we'll get back to um, Simna Keyway, um, so you'll be able to hear her presentation clearly. But we do apologise for that. What we will do in the meantime is we'll go on to um, our next artist and hopefully return back to Simni Kiwe. Um, our next artist um, who will be presenting um, is um, Lorato Shadi. And um, Lorato Shadi is a South African artist currently based in Berlin. Um, Shadi's work challenges commonplace assumptions to critique Western notions of history and make visible that which invis that is um, invisible or overlooked. Working across video, performance and installation, and often employing repetitive processes, um, Shadi um, argues the importance of centering, not just including the marginalised body as a figure of narrative experience. And so, Loretta, if you're ready, I'm um, sorry to kind of jump in, um, put you there a little bit earlier, um, the joys of technology, um, but if you're okay to present, we'll head over to you and we'll try and return back to Simna Kiwe um, once we've, um, we've rectified the connection challenges. Hi. Um, thank you for that, um, Sir Cecil, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Simna Kiwe's uh, presentation. I'm just going to jump right in. Um, we can go the show the first year. Um, and then we can go to the second slide, please. Um, this work is titled Silohilwe, and Silohilwe means that which is woven. Most of my works are titled in Setswana without giving translations to what the titles are. And here it this is a video that is seven hours long and the idea is that when the audience comes in what they see is 
they never get to experience the video the video the same way that we normally experience videos in a gallery space which is like i've made videos that are like five minutes or ten minutes long so you come in you sit down and when you get to the loop moment then you know okay i can stand up and go so here no two people get to see the same moment of the video unless they are both looking at that at the video at the same time um, and i also kind of like that with this video the people that get the most out of it are usually people who are museum or exhibition guards or people that sit the space because then they get to really experience it i kind of think of it as an hourglass where the long string that you see is being nipped from my belly and over time it grows and grows so here i think it's probably six hours and 30 minutes or something like that and then the next slide is Tloho. Tloho is a performance that's about i think two or three hours long where the performance starts with me knitting myself into the sack that I spent about two or three weeks beforehand knitting. Please go to the second slide. And here, thank you. And then here, what I do is just um, lie still for the time. So people, when they come in to see the performance, what they see is, you could say a denial of a performance in a way um, and I'm interested in, which is also similar to Silukhila, the one that I just showed you before, in hopefully challenging the audience to spend a little bit more time with the work and kind of ask themselves what's going on. And yeah, the next slide is that at the end of the performance, I, I come out and that is what's left behind. And in a lot of cases, this also becomes the relic that gets exhibited. Um, a lot of my performances also kind of have a two, a two part component to it, which is the component where the audience gets to interact or see the performance. And then the other part is the relic or what is left behind gets to stay in the space and is experienced as a sculptural object. The next work on the slide was called Mosako Wanako. And here I spent 10 days, 60 hours knitting. So each day for 10 days, I would spend six, six hours crocheting without, without a break. If you go to the next slide, what tends to happen at the end of it is that what is created is an object that disrupts the architectural space as well, an object that's a river or a carpet or a scroll. I like thinking of this work as a monument to unsung labor. If you go to the next slide, um ah, if you go to the next slide you see people in the exhibition space thank you <laughs> what um what i do when i'm sitting and knitting is i try to pay close attention to what it is that's happening in my brain and what's happening in my body and then those get recorded on the carpet so i'm interested in how the audience might not have the tools to decode the meaning that's been inscribed in the carpet, but that they do know that or have a sense that meaning has been inscribed in the carpet. Now the next slide is what's currently is a series of works. Some of them are currently at in New Art Exchange that place right now. Um, please go to the next slide. Thank you. And the next slide this one the um the works don't translate super well on camera 
so which is also which is also interesting i kind of like that that one has to actually experience them with these works the performative aspect of my work gets carried through a little bit in that i pay attention to let's say with all the works i go through a fasting process and i go through a very rigid schedule rigid work schedule and here i'm also interested in con continuing to inscribe myself in the work and also i'm interested in how the stomach is a second or a first brain often i kind of say that language is not my first language and that i feel like um, emotions are kind of my first language but they don't translate too well or I'm not very good at translating them quite well in language. So the next slide, I'm rushing through. I hope that's okay. And you don't feel like I'm, I'm rushing. Um, the next slide is a work called Seritise, which, thank you, uh, which kind of loosely or badly translated is or this honor, this honor or this uh, dignity. And here um, I was inspired by the fact that I knew South Africa was colonized by the English and the Dutch as well. So I was interested in that. I knew who Queen Elizabeth was and who Joan of Arc was and who all, who all these different um, European queens were but I didn't know any African queens. And part of my work is also an interest in historical erasure, the different types of ways that um, especially black women get erased out of history, whether it's literally uh, people being left out of the history books or whether it's how, in, how people have been written about that becomes a way of erasing their um, subjectivity. So all the mirrored ways that we get erased out of history. So here, if you please go to the next slide, I write down names of historical, thank you. I write down names of historical women of color um, who I feel like should be known, like uh, who, like Queen Nzinga, yeah, Asatwa, a lot of, absolutely incredible and amazing historical figure that a part of not just black history, but a part of world history. And also, again, I'm interested here in how if as a people, we say that we have an idea of where we want to get to without black people and people of color and black women in our history books, then the map that we're using to get to where we say we want to go is incomplete. And also black history is world history. Um, I think the idea of separating humanity into, into groups is quite problematic. So here I ask the audience to contemplate the wall, pick a name and then erase it. I also don't give any indication or information as to who the women on the wall are if you go to the next slide please so what i do is ask the audience to make the visible of the violence of erasure visible by enacting it but also if you go to the last slide to the next slide please uh, but also what the audience does is that because I don't give any information as to who the woman on the wall are, then it becomes their responsibility to get on their phone, go to Google and Wikipedia, as problematic as they are those uh, platforms, to find out who these, who the woman that they've just erased um, is. And my hope is that it just takes one step one break the idea that the great zimbabwean wall was built brick by brick i'm trying not to say wrong um 
if you go to the next step, please. So yeah, let me remember my train of thought. So, so yes, the work is two part where the one part is making the violence visible. And the second part is undoing that violence by taking ownership of our history and relearning it. And then the next slide, please. This work is titled uh, and it's try it, it, um, it translated. It means these people don't understand. And what I do here is I drill into the gallery walls to kind of um, expose in a way the structures of this space. Go to the next, go to the next slide, please. Um, so you can see here that the drilling goes right into, uh, yeah, into, into the structures and into the building. And at the end, what is, what it, what remains, please go to the next slide is a text that says who is not included in the structures of this institution. The knot goes on and off so that the text reads both ways. It reads as who is included in the structures of the institution. And it also reads as who is not included in the structures of the institution. And a lot of my work uh, has a theme of labor that runs through it. So this also continues with the plinth and uh, collecting the debris of the drilling into the walls to hopefully make that labor visible. And then we go to the last slide that just gives you a closer view of the work. Now, the next work is titled Batubame. Thank you. And it's, as you can see, um, we, the, we the people is kind of bracketed by uh, and a question mark. So then it asks, are we the people? We the people is famously known as the US preamble. It's also the South African preamble. So here I'm kind of questioning how we, yeah, systems of how we segregate ourselves and what that and what that means, what it means to be uh, allowed, you know, how in, let's say, for example, in government structures, if you have a paper, then maybe you become part of the people. If you don't have a piece of paper, then you are an illegalized person. Um, and also just ways that for example, in political speeches, we the um, but to me, the title is inspired by political speeches. It it means that um, my people. So a lot of the times you have politicians that refer to their constituents as my people, segregating and um, making. Um, yeah, differences between their voters, those, the people that vote for them and the people that don't um, vote for them. So I'm interested in how we define ourselves as people and what it means um, to include or exclude some people within this group that we call the people. Uh, please go to the next slide. Um, thank you. How am I doing with time? Can anyone hear me? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, this one here is a print of a still from a video called Mazoho. And what I'm interested in here is that if you please go to the next slide. Thank you. And the next slide. 
So the video is of hands crumbling down, crumbling a piece of cake. And so it starts off with a triangle of an edible cake and then hands crumble the piece of cake and you go to the next slide please and at the end what's left is this unedible um, thing that is no is, that no that you cannot eat um, anymore so i was also interested in how land issues looking for example at how um colonization comes in or capitalism comes in and robs the earth of all its nutrients and somehow gives it back as this barren thing that cannot be um, used and the work is also in a way inspired by the when i found out about the berlin conference of 18 something not very good with dates um where the colonial powers of the time came together and divided the continent up amongst um themselves so i'm just going to show the stills and not the videos the next video is titled uh and it's basically hand signals that play around and give a sense of a narrative. Please go to the next video. Thank you, the next slide. And here, I'm interested in how, if you have three different people from three different parts of the world looking at this video, what they will get out of it is very different. Uh, where different hand signals in different parts of the world might mean um, different things. I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lorato. Thank you for that presentation. Um, so we're going to go on to um, our next artist now, um, who is Zora Apoku. Um, so Zora Apoku um, is a German and Ghanaian artist living and working in Accra. Zora's work examines the politics of personal identity formation through historical, cultural and socio-economic influences, particularly in the context of contemporary Ghana. Apoku's explorations have been mostly through the lens of her camera. Her photography is expressed through screen printing and alternative photo processing on varieties of natural fabrics. She repeatedly, um, um, sorry, she, uh, repeatedly um, integrates family heirlooms and her own self-image into her visual observations of Ghana's cultural memory. So over to you, to you, Zora. Hello, thank you very much for the introduction. Can you hear me well? Okay, good. Uh, so I, yeah, I would like to have actually just the video going and then the images going. And I also just realized it's rather 10 minutes I have to talk, not 15. So maybe we just start it and while I'm talking, we can look at it. Um, so thank you very much for including my voice uh, in this uh, art talk series. I'm very pleased how the exhibition turned out. And um, I wanted to say first a comment to Lerato. Thank you so much. Your work is really powerful and sensitive. In the same time, I'm, I'm in awe. <laughs> so um, I'm following your work since a long time. And the reason why I want to speak to you first is because I think my uh, direction where I come from is that I grew up in a place where I had no role models or I had no um, color, uh, people of color around me until I was 13. So for me um, to identify with my surrounding, with my home, with my place um, was always uh, a contradictive um, yeah, emotional journey um, until I learned by traveling when the wall came down in, when I was 13, that I, I'm not the only one um, looking different. And um, I understood much more that I have to understand where 
I come from and where my father comes from. So um, thank you very much to um, yeah, give this um, really interesting um, presentation, especially about labor. Uh, labor is a um, very important part of my work because I chose to also do it by hand, analog and by hand. Um, it is, um, I'm really interested in the kind of uh, taking time and repeating what um, the women in my family have done, um, which is also knitting, which is um, uh, embroidery, which is uh, all craft, I, I don't know the names in English, but they are um, influence, yeah, having influenced me strongly um, during my childhood. And then again, looking at the Kente culture, uh, Kente class culture in Ghana, where the single strips are joined together. Um, um, it's also um, repeatedly shown in my work. So the, the image we are looking at here right now is, is the series we have in, in the exhibition in Nottingham. And uh, I wanted to create a piece of work I, where I can find peace uh, internal and external as a, a woman of color. And um, by not considering um, where do I belong to, where do I have to blend in, um, so nature, nature in, in general is a place where I find um, yeah, safety, um, um, the kind of um, belonging and home um, because uh, it's, it's, just a, yeah, it's just a very soothing and calming environment. And when I was at my residency in uh, California in Berkeley, uh, it was a printing, uh, yeah, it was a printing residency. I didn't realize I don't have really other artists around me because I actually plan to interview them on identity, how they identify themselves um, in yeah in this kind of really moving global uh, society. And then I want to photograph them um, because there was a series I worked on uh, since 2012 and this residency was in 2015 where I look at uh, artists, clothing, garments and um, also their historical background um, and how they um, can connect to, to those pieces. And in a very abstract way, I hung them on clotheslines or I wrapped the artists into it um, or I let the artists disappear in nature. So um, when I came to California, I realized it's just myself. I mean, there were other artists, but I couldn't really yeah, yeah, connect to them. It was not like we were studio neighbors. So I decided to uh, use the self um, as a uh, yeah the, myself as a as the subject in my uh, photographs. Um, if you could just slide like um, yeah to the next and uh, and at this time I uh, discovered the plant cultures in in uh, in the Bay Area, which is like uh, plant communities which grew there unnaturally. They were brought there as immigrants. Um, and you can find literally every kind of plant from America to a Middle European to a desert plant, a grassland plant. Um, so I was kind of um, yeah, impressed how all these plants created their new home there. So I decided also to be, become part of them, part of the family. And this is how these images um, yeah, are created. Uh, I had one assistant helping me to set them up and I, I gave the name of the plant um, as the title of the work. So the, the, the first um, yeah, kind of encounter with screen printing I had in 2014, um, at this time I did rather more textile installations and research on um, the movement between West Africa and, and Europe of like second, for instance, the second hand industry. Um, and then this time I wondered how it is when I print directly on textile and how textile, uh, the texture and um, also the, the movement of the textile actually influenced the, the image. So I started to create uh, screen prints and um, 
yeah, it became a beautiful series. And this is an exhibition in 2016, shown in Gallery 1957 here in Accra, uh, where I also combined um, the philosophy of the Akans, um, my father's ethnical group, um, the, the Ashantis, um, which is like a kingdom, um, uh, like one of the oldest kingdom you can even think of, and the other sculptures who represent family members who kind of um, create the family I believe I belong to. Uh, if you could continue sliding. And so with, with those um, prints, I experimented with all kinds of um, yeah, of all kinds of materials, and on the left uh, there's a, a cotton, a cotton canvas, and on the on the right you you see a, a denim, and it yeah when when you would see the close up you would see how actually the the image has a conversation with the texture of the fabric, and um, that was actually yeah the first time I really fell in love. Um, with um, the print media um, before on just on paper it was for me too clean and too predictable and um, with textile you you very often also create um, results uh, results you yeah you haven't thought of it um, if you could slide forward uh, so in, in Ghana, we have um, a lot of uh, local uh, handcrafts, and uh, one is one material being used is the sugar cane. And uh, I wanted to create, yeah, kind of a little army of of these uh, women I photographed, and the women who are all me. But then in the end, it's like all a part of me, which becomes then kind of a group of women who I can identify with. And I, I like the idea of uh, incorporating the cane as the installation uh, material and ra rather than yeah, framing it or um, just pinning it on, onto the wall. And by having them floating in the room, it's like walking actually in between um, yeah, the different selves. Um, I, I love the, the idea of um, bringing the image into the space. Um, if you could. Forward. Yes, um, so here you see another angle of, of, the, um, yeah, of the installation um, with another sculpture um, I created um, alongside um, the textile prints. If you could um, go to the next slide. Um, here, this is the, the fig tree which was in my garden in, in California and uh, the woman who hosted me, she was also an artist. Um, she gave me absolute freedom to move around and do everything and I woke up every morning and looked at these figs. So it was also becoming part of, of my memory um, I created in, in California. Um, yeah, and then a little comment to also the uh, stitching. Here I started also to think of how can I stitch. This is, for instance, a print on a hand wash paper, and here you can actually see how neat and clean the print is because it has not really a surface to interact with. And this is a photo of an exhibition in, in Greece on Mykonos at the Archaeological Museum where we had a kind of a conversation with the, um, yeah, with the archaeological collection of the museum. And um, here again, I, I uh, chose to have them yeah, shown as an army, as a group, and um, where you would also not really recognize me in the most of the pictures because my hair is different, the, the shade is different, the, um, yeah, the disguise is different, and uh, I love how it can actually be uh, someone else. And speaking of someone else, I was always uh, believing that um, I have to be like one person uh, to whichever place I'm traveling to or I am. 
Um, but since I have moved to Ghana 10 years ago, I realized that there are so many different selves and so many different identities, and they are always kind of changing and de de developing um, according to the, the space I'm finding myself in. So I, I stopped also um, thinking I have to be in a one particular way. So also creating the work really helped me to understand how um, being a, a, a woman of color, being othered in a different place, um, doesn't need to be a, a stressful um, kind of uh, experience. It is actually something what we can all play with. And so we are all kind of evolving in a very fast global um, yeah, society. We, uh, I think we all learn also to adjust and to just um, yeah show the show the face we want to show in that particular moment. Um, this is an exhibition in 2016 at 154, and here I yeah found a different way how to install the work. So I I really love also to play around with the fact that I have fabric and it is not just uh, stiff on the wall or in the frame. So um, this is a great fact about um, using fabric as the as the uh, carrying material. Um, I, th I think we are missing the video, but I don't know if we will still show them. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so. Um, so I try to just um, yeah and con conclude then yeah the, the photographs I I create created for for that series actually um, became became something else after I started using a screen print because at uh, the New York uh, Exchange um, they are uh, printed on 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 paper it's a pigment print but I very very quick understood that. I mean, it's it's beautiful, and I love them. But I very quick understood that um, to actually be really uh, involved in a process and to also have all my skills I learned as a fashion designer, I learned as a photographer, um, I learned uh, at home um, with my family. Um, I I need this this process of creating screens like in a dark room because it's also a, a photosensitive process. I need. Um, uh, to touch textile and to play also with the fact uh, what textile can do with the image and I need the um, yeah the flexibility of putting the textile together the way I want to so um, today um, the textile uh, beca became a really larger role also in the terms of the works became much more larger scale because I really explore how to make the image um, larger by joining pieces together to to uh, the works and yeah so that's I think that's it Thank you very much, Zora. Um, that was really insightful. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, and so before we go into the um, panel discussion, which will be chaired by Lisa Anderson, um, we're going to go back to Sydney Kiwe Balungo, um, who will um, resume her presentation. Um, some of you who um, have been tuned in from the beginning um, may have seen that she'd begun her presentation, but there were just some technical challenges. So we'll head back for her to, to continue. Hello, hi. Uh, I hope it's working now. Uh, just let me know if it gets stuck again. Um, so yes, apologies again for the technical difficulties. Uh, I'm going to resume, but maybe just backtrack a little bit for anyone who maybe did not get a chance to hear. Um, my, well, my presentation is uh, really focused on my contribution to LAST. Um, unfortunately, I cannot play the audio from the cassette tapes, but I did contribute um, a selection and a set of uh, mixtapes, um, most of which had been recorded in 2019 um, when I was on a residency in Wising in Cambridge, which was part of the Future Assembly residency, which was actually uh, facilitated by Hansi, who also curated this exhibition. So it was a very nice connection between the two. and. Um, because this uh, residency was in the countryside in Cambridge, there was like a lot of just like rolling hills and grass and just land. 
um, my body felt a bit different to because I was encouraged to walk, you know, and so my body felt a bit uh, strange to kind of be located in so much land and so much, not necessarily access, but the access to walk all of this land and know that the mechanism that allows this land to be what it is, is not divorced from the mechanism that prevents me from doing the same thing back home in South Africa. So I had, um, and I've been working with tapes for a while in my practice. Uh, I always have a walk person recorder. Um, and I would just walk and record my thoughts uh, through this discomfort, through this incong incongruity. I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, and then they developed into uh, somewhat anecdotal, somewhat theoretical, sometimes funny and mundane uh, recordings. Um, and then they kind of followed this natural sequence of uh, a mixtape. And then I kind of, um, through all the different themes, I kind of arrived at uh, this idea of notes to self, which is then also another project which has existed in many forms. Um, but for this particular one, the notes to self was in reference to self-historicizing, self-actualizing, self-referencing, and self-determination. So all these different forms of self, and these are what I'd been speaking about uh, on these tapes. Um, so for Laced, they've kind of been, uh, how do I say, re reorganized into these themes because I had always wanted to kind of frame them in the themes because everything was so scattered, but I just never had the chance and now I was able to do so. Um, so yeah, and then in addition to that, I uh, contributed uh, additional material, uh, additional audio, uh, because the tapes are, are, when I was listening back to everything, I kind of got sick of the sound of my voice. So I contributed um, uh, uh, recordings from an organ piano. Um, I like gospel music, so the connection is, is, is quite visible, but uh, I, I play around with, with the organ. I'm not a musician, but I just like pressing the keys. Uh, and so it became a very interesting filter when I would be listening to all the audio for these tapes and kind of take a break and then play around. So then it became like a companion to all the material I had recorded. But also I was thinking it in terms of walking with the walk person. If you're listening to music on your phone, music is a companion to walking. Uh, and then walking becomes a methodology for all this uh, for these thoughts to happen, for these thoughts to be produced. Um, so there is a combination of uh, the tapes from 2019, as well as a newer recorded material from 2021. Um, what I do wanna focus on is uh, the liner notes or publications, which uh, I don't actually think they get enough credit, but um, for those who still buy physical music forms, you'll most likely get liner notes. And liner notes are not just the cover of the uh, of the, the tape or the vinyl or the CD or whatever. Uh, liner notes uh, contain uh, maybe lyrics. Uh, who is the producer? Who is the arranger? Who's the mixing and mastering person? Where was it recorded? Which year was, was it recorded? Which uh, city, et cetera. Maybe it includes um, additional photographs, uh, you know, fan club, uh, email, uh, email addresses and Instagram handles, all of this kind of stuff. And I quite enjoy the form of the, the liner note as the additional reading while you're listening. So there's a simultaneous um, interaction happening. So I use the fold out of the cassette tapes to create liner notes, not just about the tapes themselves, because I felt they were quite literally self-explanatory and my voice is a bit too uh, present. So the liner notes then functioned as publications uh, to then expand on this idea of uh, you know, self-determination, referencing, et cetera, um, as well as other things that maybe I mentioned in the tape, but uh, actually kind of look back and revert it and wanted to, to, to uh, speak about again. Um, so they became uh, almost mind maps in a way, like uh, GPS <laughs> for sitting or like GPS for reading. Um, and, and a lot of them chart on so many different references that may have been overlooked when you listen to the tape, or maybe you didn't get a chance to hear it, or even newer references, that are newer connections that I made when I was listening back to everything. Um, so the first one you see here, for example, uh, has an image of uh, Ellis Coltrane and a tape. And the, for example, the reason I reference this is because Ellis Coltrane had her own uh, cassette tape label, 
and publication level. And this for me, I speak about in the tapes as a form of self-determination. And could you go to the next slide? Thank you. And Nikki Giovanni, uh, a well-known poet and activist from the United States also had her own uh, label called Nictom, which was named after herself and her son. Uh, so she could release her poetry vinyls. This is also a form of self-determination. Next slide, please. Um, Gerard Sekoto, a well-known South African modernist painter who was exiled from the country and went to France um, in the earlier part of the 20th century, who on arrival to France did not have a lot of money and could not speak the language and was struggling. Um, but he was a musician and as it turns out, he recorded an album of gospel slash uh, spirituals which was then recorded onto an, uh, to vinyl, which is very difficult to find these days. Um, again, a form of uh, self-determination and survival. So all these different forms of noting to self are also located in real or historical moments and situations. Um, and so, and a lot of them also start as either literature or music. They're just general interests that I have and things I was thinking about when I was recording the uh, tapes. Could you go to the next slide? Um, and this is an example of uh, Sekoto's album and also Sekoto's um, uh, paintings. And this is very interesting because you see his paintings that he was painting prior to exile when he was still living to South Africa and after he went to France. And you can see it's, very, it's well documented that there's a different stylistic change in the way that he was painting. But uh, then I kind of started to make these connections to uh, walking, uh, which is what I was doing with the tapes, but also walking as an actual methodology and walking as leisure or walking as labor. And then you can see like he's kind of painted them in different ways, whether it's walking or strolling or pacing or I'm late for a meeting type of walking or, uh, you know, that kind of what's the different urgency of the walking. Um, could you please go to the next slide? And then I just connect, oh, excuse me connected it to other things. Like uh, when I was on the residency, I was taking a lot of film photographs and uh, most of them feature as covers for these liner notes. Um, so I also make references to, to my own impulses while I was uh, in this residency, or the B-sides that you'd never hear about that uh, were actually very instrumental into making these cassette tapes. Could you go to the next slide, uh, which, involves eating ground fruits of different kinds uh, and connecting this to either the sun or uh, other kinds of uh, influences that allowed me to record the tapes and the conditions. Um, for example, the uh, audio material that I recorded on the organ piano, um, as a companion, I was also thinking about different weather situations as, as companions to walking, um, such as clouds, uh, sun, rain, um, wind, all of these kinds of things as things that shape the way you walk or whether you're going to walk or what you wear when you walk. Um, yeah, please go to the next slide. Uh, and the next slide again. Yeah, and then again, coming back to the musical references, um, the some James Brown was listening to a lot of funk at the time. Please go to the next slide. Um, and so, these liner notes, which exist in real life in the space and can be read and interacted with, like I said, they are real life GPS, but um, there's quite a few of them and they make a lot of connections that at first, if you put them together, seem uh, a bit uh, disconnected and if not, maybe tangential. Um, but I suppose because there is a sequence, there's quite a few of them in their number, it makes sense to kind of read them one after the other or like a, a contained tape after another contained tape. Could you go to the next slide? Uh, and, oh yeah, this one is a favorite. I'm just, just gonna mention this one. Uh, I mentioned this as well in the tapes as a, an excerpt from a text by the South African writer slash author slash scholar, Unjabulo uh, Ndebele. He wrote a text called uh, The Rediscovery of the Ordinary, which I, I somehow placed in relation to hip hop song. I don't know how I did that or why, um, but that is also quite important in understanding. He, he mentioned somewhere, I don't know if it's in this text or like a little bit um, later on in some of his other work, but 
essentially he mentions that uh, it's not always about like apartheid as a concept because I will mention this just now um, because of the way it influences an activity like walking uh, was not only about doom and gloom and that it's very possible to still live and have mundane events and have anecdotes through a larger social political climate uh, which influences the way in which your body exists in a specific society. Could we go to the next slide? Yeah, so this one, I don't know how much time I have, but I just, I'm just going to mention this one. Um, this is a photograph of the house I stayed in at Rising, which is very, very, very um, comfortable, very cute, and it's 400 years old. And I remember arriving with all my bags, like fresh from the air, from the train, and they're telling me like, oh yeah, this house is like 400 years old. And I was like, what? how old is it like 400 years old i was and then i was like this is a bit spooky because <laughs> i for some reason when i thought 400 years old i immediately thought of um it was less than 400 years ago if i'm not mistaken that south africa was you know quote colonized by the dutch uh through uh someone named jan van riebeck um which is a story which is oddly not spoken about that i live in amsterdam um but the the connection of this house and the the amount of years it is the 400 years and then thinking about the colonial conquest and then i'm doing this residency in the uk which is also just as implicit in the colonial influence in south africa and uh, all of these other things and the reason why people you walk a, a different way or your body moves a different way is all connected to in some way the year this house was built i mean these are the connections i was making at the time can we go to the next slide yeah, and this is an example of the 1913 Natives Land Act, which dispossessed land from Black South Africans. Also an example of this colonial conquest, which is not divorced from these years of the sequencing of time um, and how something like this uh, is just the beginning of another sequence of, of laws that prevented um, people of color in South Africa from doing certain, actually all South Africans from doing certain things and controlled our bodies in a specific way, controlled our language, our minds, our interactions, yeah. our relationships. Um, and even one to think of is the past laws in which you had a curfew and you could not be in certain areas at certain times of the evening, you had to be at home. Or, so if you see a police officer, you need to kind of prepare and get your pass ready. Or if you don't have your pass, are you going to run away? So walking is not, walking becomes politicized in a way which is not divorced again from the walking I was doing when I was in Cambridge. And so the cassette tapes really uh, are a way of me processing um, all of this, uh, but also in between all of that slice in everyday urgencies that I had when I was there, for example, don't forget to wash the dishes or uh, don't forget to do groceries or keep your receipts so you can get reimbursed. Um, and this goes back to the Njabulu and Devele quote about uh, doom and gloom and that it's not every day. <laughs> um, uh, the last slide, the next slide, please. Yeah, and then again, musical references. This one is an example of something I was listening to. I was listening to a lot of um, Mr. Fingers, um, which is a lot of early house music from the United States in the 80s, uh, which is also like another contrast. You like listening to this heavy club music with these 4-4 uh, kick, kick drums and these bass lines, and you're like in the countryside with like somebody's horses and cows, <laughs> which is like, I don't know, it's not, it's not unique, but in that kind of moment and with the specific subject matter that I was recording onto this walk person and then like listening to this club music and then you're thinking about walking and how does one walk in a club who gets to go inside of a club how does walking get translated into voguing into dancing and who gets to to dance who gets to vogue you know which bodies get to uh, you know what I mean so I I, I um again bringing into uh, these other references that I had mentioned on the tips and the last slide please uh, yeah, and then, you know, even just like screenshots of uh, WhatsApps coming in because you're also kind of navigating these different technological devices of like a cell phone and a walk person, cassette tape and like internet and data and all of these kinds of things. So, yeah, I think the, the liner notes are a good textual way of, of reading and, and of text and of writing about uh, in its own way, historicizing these cassette tapes, which are not easily accessible because they are a physical medium that need to be played on a specific form of equipment. So 
So I just hope that um, and I'm very glad that they're able to exist in the exhibition um, alongside their tapes and alongside all the other amazing works um, featured in the exhibition. So I'm going to end there because I think I'm over time. Thank you very much, Simi Kiwe. Um, that's a really great presentation. Um, so we're going to go into the panel discussion, which will be chaired by Lisa Anderson. Um, but before we do so, um, a quick introduction to Lisa. Um, so Lisa is an avid contemporary arts enthusiast, an advisor with expert knowledge on, for, on art from the African diaspora in the UK and beyond. In 2015, she launched Black British Art as an online curatorial platform to showcase the variety of depth in this phenomenal corner of the art market. In 2016, she was selected as one of 10 curators to complement the International Curator for Curators Forum, or ICF's Diaspora Pavilion project for the 2017 Venice Biennale. She has since curated private exhibitions for Latham and Watkins, featuring artists who have gone on to be selected as Bloomberg New Contemporary Artists and featured in major international art collections. She has represented artists at Basel and as a trustee for Addis Fine Art, visited international um, biennales during the Grand Tour, presented papers at a number of academic conferences and um, written articles for a variety of arts platforms. Lisa has also just been appointed the Managing Director of Black Cultural Archives in London as well. Um, so we're hopefully gonna connect to Lisa now um, who will chair the conversation. I think we might have a few um, technical issues in connecting to Lisa. Um, so in that case, what I'll do is I'll begin with some of the... Um, oh, I think Lisa might be back. Out that. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Can you hear me? Can you, but there's a digital challenge us in the smooth running of the conversation. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. You let me dive right in then. Thank you for this opportunity to engage with the entire test. I think we may have lost Lisa there for a moment. Um, so what I'll do is I'll begin with some of the feedback um, that Lisa had. Um, oh, I think Lisa might be back. Um, so we've just lost Lisa there, um, but whilst um, we try to reconnect with Lisa, um, we'll just begin with a, um, a comment that Lisa um, sent, sent through um, about the exhibition, and we'll go on to the first question as well. Um, so this is for the artist. Um, I love this exhibition. It's a meditation on possibility and creation through different artistic practices um, as such it's a moving in some ways subtle and delicate opening for self-embrace and connection as a com communal art of liberation. Given that, love, given that the love for artists, as well as the respect for the generative power of love, is interlaced throughout the exhibition, this feels like a warm embrace. In fact, in Lauren's gorgeous poem, she states, the choice to love is a choice to connect, to find ourselves in the other. And so this leads us on to the first questions uh, for our artists. Um, and um, uh, Simi Kiwes or uh, Lorato, feel free to jump in to, to answer this question. How did you see yourself in the work of the other artists in this exhibition? And we can get some Nikki way to answer that one first, if you like. Um, yeah, I mean, it's okay. Um, I think from my understanding of the exhibition, because I haven't been able to see it, um, I think there are, there are irrefutable threads amongst all the works. Um, specifically with Zora's uh, work and the photographs, this thing of foliage is actually quite interesting um, because uh, 
it's about how do you place yourself in a situation that maybe doesn't really expect you to be there in the first place and then how do you navigate it and what do you do with the material that you were there and i, I feel like this was quite similar to my process when i was in uh, cambridge um and found myself in this countryside with all this green land that i could only be there because i have a visa and all these kinds of things um and i, I kind of uh, found that connection uh, there, just from the, the top of my head. Great, thank you so much for that, um, Cindy Kiwe. And, um, and Zora, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, I think I already mentioned before how I could really connect to Lerato's work because I was also following her since quite a while, I mean, actually a long while. And I really understand um, the pieces which involve labor of knitting and um, what can um, develop through this process. I also feel like um, giving patient and giving like full attention to one particular thing, um, a lot of things can come out of it. And um, yeah, so since I'm a global and the internet is taking over everything, um, as we can see now, um, like this kind of analog, um, slow um, motion process of creating something um, yeah, can be very meditative, um, very healing, and um, very involving in, in so many layers of, of life and um, connecting to, yeah, connecting to the self, which is for me um, always like the question in the work how do I connect to myself um, in various environments? Well, thank you very much, Zora. And Loretto? Um, actually, I think both um, Zora and Cindy were echo what I'm thinking. For example, in connecting with um, yourself, and I find walking, as uh, Cindy Kiwa was talking, I was thinking of walking as a practice of meditation as well, um, looking at the U.S. presentation and Dara's presentation, I could see myself in both the works and I really enjoyed how you both delved and delved into the work, yeah. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll just see if we can reconnect to Lisa. Um, oh, I think we haven't reconnected yet. So um, we'll go on to the next question, um, which is, um, what possibilities did inclusion in this program, reflecting on the laid meanings of lace, open up for your practice? Oh, could you repeat this, please? Uh, yes, sorry. Um, what possibilities did inclusion in this programme or this exhibition, um, reflecting on the layered meanings of laced, open up for your practice? Yeah, I believe just the title laced is a very feminine space um, to think of um, the word itself and uh, just um, thinking what lace is doing, um, since it is something what is half visible, half invisible, and it can be used in various forms of uh, clothing, but also um, speaking um, as a metaphor, it, it brings us like through something what we can actually really discover um, by really looking closely um, through the lace. So I, yeah, I really love the idea because I was laced actually in one series where I created also self-portraits um, out of my yeah, different pieces from my wardrobe. And I wanted to recreate a veil which fire on the Muslim women of the um, Hausa community here in Indonesia. And I, I didn't think of using already like ready-made clothes or something what I can find, but I could relate to it by looking at the material you can find here from um, the house dress codes. It's very colorful and a lot of lace, but then the lace has a label, so you actually can't see the buttons and everything is weird. 
and a plate um, of simple lace or something. So, so it was. Um, we may have lost um, Zora slightly there. Um, so we'll have, oh. um, whilst we just, oh, hi Zora, can you hear us? Yes. Sorry, we may have lost you slightly there just towards the end of what you were saying. Um, are you okay to just repeat the last couple of sentences? Um, of your uh, yeah, response? I think, so I mentioned how I used lace in one of my books. Um, called Hamatan Tales, where I was imitating whales um, out of clothes from my wardrobe. Um, also, lace materials are included. And I was inspired by the Hausa women, um, it, um, yeah, which is also a large community here in, in Ghana, um, the, the Hausa um, ethnic group being um, yeah, the, the Muslims um, in Ghana. And I was really interested in or intrigued by how lace plays a very important role in their dress codes, but then they put a layer in between to completely veil their body. And in the end, you have um, yeah, the lace not really revealing anything. So I, I made an opposite uh, process by using it as a, as a play to reveal more. Um, because I feel like looking at a veiled woman, you actually see what you don't see, and um, that's that's the in interesting part about it. And yeah, that's that was a little bit like I use it as a metaphor of of revealing. Oh, thank you very much, Zora. And um, um, Loretto, um, do, would you like me to repeat the question, Loretto? Um, I think it's okay. I really also like what Zara saying and bringing up other other ideas that were coming into my head. And the series works that I in connect very in a way between most as well. What I was enjoying about this exhibition. <laughs> it's funny. I can hear myself. Um, this part of me is like, but I'll continue. Uh, so <laughs> when Hans when Hans came back to to me with her poem, and we were talking about love as a source of creative energy, I think in terms of influencing my work, it's it's kind of the conversations that we were having and. Uh, continuing to have, uh, um, and the ones that I'm having with uh, Lisa Robinson and Diana and um, Delancey and everyone. So I think that, yeah. I think for I hope that oh. makes sense. I'm still I'm still laughing at the fact that I can hear myself in the background. <laughs> this is so funny. Yeah, there's some feedback. Um, but I, I guess for me, I for me personally, and I don't know if this really answers the question, but uh, I think being able to go back to a work and finding that the work had connections to you know, the framework of the exhibition, but I was not really privy to that at the time of creating the work, of course, and only realizing certain things upon revisiting the work and listening to something over and over again, no matter how many times I hear it, and saying like, ah, okay, I was thinking about this, or I don't know, in some kind of abstract way. Maybe I do know what love is, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, because I, I think there are many things that I was not aware of when I made these tapes. And that's also just because I was looking at them in a very different way. Um, but now that that particular moment in the series is done and literally and big, like archived onto a physical medium, um, going back to them through fast forwarding and rewinding and flipping a tape, uh, gives space to, to see other connections uh, in, in a, a more distanced kind of 
Yeah, thank you very much for that, um, Simni Kiwe. Oh. And thank you very much for your um, response as well, um, Loretto. I think we have Lisa back, um, so we'll get Lisa. We'll just try and reconnect to Lisa now. Lisa, can you hear us? Hi, Lisa, can you hear us? Oh, I think she may, it may have dropped off again, so I do apologise for that. Um, Sometimes these things happen, don't they? Technical, um, technical challenges. Um, so I do apologise for that. Um, but thank you so much for your patience um, and bearing with us. It just means that I ask um, for, I get to just ask um, some of um, Lisa's questions, a few more of Lisa's questions. Um, so the next um, of Lisa's questions are: Is um, can you talk about your relationship um, with materiality in the production of knowledge, i.e., thinking of your mediums as a form of lacing between ideas through your creative process? Maybe I can uh, start. Oh. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll go. Sorry. Oh, I, sorry. <laughs> overlap. Um, it's a little bit delayed. Yeah, you go. The for me, I have been using tapes for a while in my practice. Um, also, I grew up with them a little bit. Um, so that was almost. A natural thing to go to also because the words were pre-existing um to kind of bring them back for least i think also made sense and i, I the, the the physicality and materiality of them as saved or archival bodies was quite important for me but also because i knew the process to play them would be beautifully complicated and i kind of wanted to also introduce that into into this um because I think maybe when we speak of connections or lacing things together and all of these things, um, for me, I also think it's important to bring the complications that come with that, uh, or the translations or mistranslations or wrongly translated things that come with that, um, or maybe weaving something together and then like, I don't know, miss a step. So I think also uh, with bringing the tapes back, uh, and knowing that there's always going to be problems with uh, cassette tapes, either finding the materials to play it or tapes that tear or tapes that jam, uh, tapes that break apart, uh, cassette tape players that stop working in the middle of things, uh, not being able to get parts. For me, it's quite important because um, I think it's sort of the, it's very much part of the, of course, part of the process, but part of the, the narrative aspect that um these kinds of connections are very very complicated and i i wonder if maybe if we speak of them as as uh something that's easy to do but i, I think there's also a lot more that kind of comes with that um, so i think the tapes also introduce a kind of uh complication personally which i think we need more of thank you very much Loretto, and um Zora, would you like to to answer that question? Yeah. Wait, that was Simniki Way. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you very much for that. Sorry, Simniki Way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> sorry, I do apologise. <laughs> um, and uh, Zora, would you like to answer that yeah. question? Yeah, I, I totally relate what uh, Simniki Way says. Sorry, I'm I'm probably pronounce your name totally wrong. Um, I. I think like like the failure, the the kind of uh, yeah, um, when something doesn't work out, that's actually when the work really begins. Um, I deal a lot with um, troubleshooting or um, kind of faulty images, faulty prints, um, and um, then more interesting than when I have like everything is working out perfectly um, in printing and also every print in the end turns out also completely different. Sometimes it's too thick, sometimes too thin, sometimes um, um, things are missing. Um, also by um, just creating the screens, it, it, I mean it starts from it's there are so many steps um, and mishaps in between 
that it's not you know never a perfect process. So I'm I really started to embrace um, the kind of fact of imperfection and um, especially here in a place where I have to do a lot of uh, kind of um, improvising and finding solutions how I do things here because I maybe I can't get the material um, for instance when I expose a screen I need a um, emulsion um, which I can buy but because I can't buy it here that way I would create it myself with glue and with other chemicals and this kind of um, combination of these chemicals has to be perfect so it also creates a perfect image in the screen to have a perfect print later. So um, it, it is um, kind of interesting that um, I come really from a place where everything is so organized. I learned the screen printing in Netherlands which is really the, like the place where you have a lot of yeah, graphic design, um, silk screen printers, um, bookmakers and also textile um, textile printing and every, everything is just perfect and then yeah you you work in Ghana and you have like an opposite situation so um, now for me it is like I'm not planning as much ahead as I would be and I would just be happy when something suddenly works out very well and very often prints um, look interesting and I just use them as they are even though it is not what I expected. Thank you very much for that, Zora. And Loretto, did you want to add to, to that response? Uh, do you have your response for that question? Um, it's funny because I feel like I just want to say, yeah, ditto, <laughs> to um, <laughs> Simni Q and Zora. And, and um, um, it's, it's somehow like, um, I'm, I'm enjoying this this whole process right now because I'm finding so many um, connections and um, similarities between processes and thinking and um, and works and parts of me um, are also enjoying just listening to Simni Kiwa and Zora speaking and like feeling like, oh, I don't have to say much because they've already said it. Like, yeah, <laughs> there, <laughs> there's, there's a beauty in, 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 in fighting with material and there's, there's a beauty in, in, the, in the frustrations that, um, that, that come around and that get you to find um, other things. There's a beauty to going, I'm never working with video ever again. Uh, <laughs> or, <laughs> and then you come back or yeah, like you choose your material and you're like, never again, never, ever after work it's done. Or you, or when, when you're in the process of it and when it's done, you go, wow, okay, that was cool. I enjoyed that. So yeah. I'm just enjoying um, listening to both of you and um, yeah, and, and have you and have you also speak for me in a way. So thanks. Thank you very much for that, Loretto. And then I um, suppose we just have one final question um, for all of you, um, which is um, where do you, could you give us an insight really into what's next um, for your in a bit more detail in terms of what. Uh, in terms of your practice, um, what are you? Do you have anything um, planned in terms of the way you want to take your practice um, in the near future? Uh, so, so for me, actually, something really changed last year. In um, I, I started creating a work, a new body of work in Berlin, and since I normally work in, in Ghana or probably more in tropical environments um, or warm environments. It was a winterly um, yeah, set up and I was having, um, yeah, yeah, having to wear like layers to be warm and everything. And I spent a lot of time still in nature and realized how, how, yeah, how gray everything is. 
So I started to incorporate colors into my work um, by just having a lack of colors around me. And I found it really interesting because before I never really realized I'm really in love with monochrome colors because I come also from a place of analog photography and also my childhood uh, memory photos, uh, photographs, um, our family albums are mostly black and white when I was a child. And um, so that was is something what really changed and also in, in terms of how I process um, the images I print uh, before I would maybe divide an image in, in sections and then I join it to a big piece so I can you know achieve a larger piece. Now I would uh, print the same image and use that image in different works um, as a unique piece and not as a, let's say, as an addition um, to um, create like different storytelling within uh, a piece. So that means it's um, maybe uh, one head or one, one, one eye or one, um, one tree I would use um, in different images, uh, like for a different story. And um, this made me uh, like become really thinking about how to combine colors and also how to yeah, create collages. So that's really a change since last year. And um, I'm, I'm sure also I might go back and maybe com combine the both, what I did before and what I do now. But I'm really enjoying right now to use colors. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Zora. And Loretta Rawson Kiwe. Um. Uh, for me, I'm just doing research. Hey, to be honest, I'm just trying to focus on uh, doing research. I've been working with a beekeeper for a few months. That's pretty interesting. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of in a a mode of of doing research. Um, and I'm not particularly sure, and I wonder if I'm interested in in knowing particularly what it's going to manifest into. But I've been enjoying doing research as I'm more of a long form. I think this is also just a, a, a symptom or a condition rather of, of the past year and the pandemic and being forced to slow down and then what do you do when things pick up again. Um, so I, for me at the moment, I'm, I'm just really trying to focus, attempting to focus more on, on uh, the research uh, more than I did before in my practice. Yeah, thank you, Simone Kiwe. And finally, Loretto. Um... Uh, let's say the works in your art exchange right now series that kind of new as well there's always I feel like the work finds a way to surprise me a lot of the times and yeah I'm not sure what's new I'm also doing a lot of reading um, yeah, I mean, there's, I'm working on a new work, but I don't know how, I don't know how to answer that question. Can you see? Yeah. Can you see? I'm like, I'm not too sure how to answer what's new because, um, I think also what's nice with what Zora said is that, um, I feel like her articulation came so wonderfully also because Zara you had the um uh you had hindsight you're like okay when I was in Berlin this what this is what happened so now now I'm in this uh process so I feel like maybe a little bit more like Simniki where I'm in the process of it and maybe we'll see what something new um yeah, comes comes out of it. Thank you. And it's also worth noting as well, um, Lorato, um, if you don't mind me mentioning, that you are currently in residence with um, at New Art Exchange. You're currently doing a remote um, residency um, at the moment. I didn't know if you wanted to speak a little bit about that um, in terms of um, the, uh, the, the type of research that you're conducting at the moment. Um, for this residency? Um, I think it, it, it just continues on this love as a source of creative energy and uh, and connecting with 
joy and figuring out how to how to make space how to make work from um yeah from a space of love instead of maybe from a space of of anger and also because of the pandemic uh i think it's really important to to responsibly take care of us it was it was difficult it was difficult to speak about it because self-care has kind of become a commercialized industry and i'm thinking how do i not fall into the how do i not fall into a trap where you think i'm speaking about that but i'm not talking about that so i hope that made sense thank you very much for that Loretto. thank you um, so a massive thank you um, to you all. Um, we've come to the end of our um, panel discussion. Um, so thank you so much to, um, to Simli Kiwe Bulungu, um, Lorato Shadi and Zora Apoku. And a very special thanks to Lisa Anderson as well, um, who was here at the beginning of the conversation and who put some of the questions together um, for the Q&A. Um, and um, her apologies um, that we weren't able to connect. Um, but thank you so much again to all of you for your patience and to our audience as well and for watching um, as mentioned at the beginning of this discussion um, this video will be available to watch back um, on New Art Exchange's YouTube channel and the exhibition Laced will run um, at New Art Exchange until the 8th of January 2022 so if you are in the UK and you are able to come and see the exhibition physically please do feel free to come along to New Art Exchange and um, the exhibition can also be viewed online um, through a digital space um, and that can be accessed through our website as well so you can do a digital 3d walkthrough of the exhibition online um, and also just a reminder to our audiences um, we would love to hear your feedback um, so my colleague will place a, the link um, for a survey um, in the chat um, and if you do have a few minutes please do feel free to answer those questions because that will help us to kind of continue um, and improve the work that we do um, online as well and program wise and um, and yeah thank you so much again to everyone we hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon thank you again to our speakers and to Lisa Anderson as well and uh, we look forward to engaging with you for our next event take care bye bye thank you so much bye, bye. thank you for having us